to see you here today and to be in the house of the Lord with you. Amen. We're going to be in your victorious hymns to begin with. Number 232, if you would stand, we'll sing the solid rock. Number 232 in your victorious hymns.
Number 244. 244. Sing higher ground.
Spot number 241. 241, under his wing.
Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Merciful Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the comforts that we receive, Lord, from the knowledge of you and, Lord, through the blessing and through the grace of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we can, even in our trials, Lord, we can know that you're leading. And we, when we surrender through you, Lord, we can know that uh, you care for us and that, uh, that, you, that your thoughts are, are for us. And we ask, dear Lord, that uh, with this, armed with this confidence and the steadfastness that's your steadfastness and led in the paths of righteousness as you lead us, Lord, that we would now look into your word and, Lord, we'd be ready to receive your word and that our hearts would be open to your spirit. Father, guide us through this word this morning. And help us, dear Lord, to give you the glory in all things, to see your truth that you've preserved for us, and let the power of your word be effectual in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're going to be studying... I'm going to do one of those things that I, I do sometimes. I'm going to take a big chunk of the Bible and we're going to go through it in just a few minutes, okay? <laughs> uh, I like doing that. I really like getting the, the 30,000 foot view of, of things of the scripture and uh, it helps me to understand the details. And so then when we get into the details, we can see them and see how they fit more clearly. We're going to look into the books of Ezra and Nehemiah this morning. And so if you want to turn to Ezra, that's where we're going to start. And these books uh, give an account of the history of Israel as they are returning from captivity. And um, they're returning into Jerusalem. They're turning in, uh, returning to the cities of their inheritance. You'll remember the tribes of Israel were the, the land the, that God promised to Abraham. Abraham was divvied out uh, as to their inheritance by tribe, and when they were taken away, carried captive, they were carried out of that land, and it was left vacant, and what happens with vacant lands? Well, the neighboring people came in, they kind of took it over, and uh, so now we see they've gone through 70 years of captivity, and they're returning into their lands. Now, for a little bit of history here, we know that they were carried away, the northern ten tribes were carried away captive by the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire came in and, and invaded them, and God allowed that because of the sins of those tribes under um, uh, their, the, their leadership there. They, they had set up... Um, under Jeroboam, they had set up their golden calves, and they were worshiping their golden calves, and they weren't coming down into Israel anymore, and this went on for a number of years and, and for centuries, and the Lord said, enough is enough, and uh, carried, had them carried away captive. And so they were carried away by the Assyrians, but then the Babylonian Empire rose, rose up, and they gobbled up the Assyrian Empire. And so now the Jews of the northern ten tribes that had been captive by the Assyrians were now captives of the Babylonians. And then the Babylonians came up and they captured the southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And so they, they occupied Judah and Jerusalem. And in that way, guess what? All of Israel is united again under Babylonian captivity. Isn't it amazing how God works? This is one of the great mysteries, I think, of history to, to look at and see how God worked and was able in his mercy to bring Israel back together again under Babylonian captivity. And God gave Israel over to their enemies because they had forsaken him. And so for 70 years they remained captives. They were separated from their lands. They were separated from their homes. They were also separated from Jerusalem. The temple that Solomon had made was destroyed by the Babylonians. And the city which God had put up, up, uh, his name upon was destroyed. And God had designed and desired that, uh, that uh, God's name would be upon that city in Jerusalem. God would dwell amongst his people there in the, it would, in the altar. They would worship him. He would be their, their God and, and, and um, they would be his people. But they sinned and they rebelled. And so he had them carried away captive. 
Well, in time, the Babylonians were gobbled up by the Medes and the Persians. And so now, all of the Israelites became wards of the Medo-Persian Empire. And God is still working through these, these kings. God is working, and he moves in the heart. Early on in the Medo-Persian Empire, he moves in the heart of their king to allow Israel to go back into the land and rebuild their homes, rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. And so we have in the, this account in Ezra and Nehemiah of the stages in which this took place. And so, again, the, the marvelous hand of God upon his people, even though they had been rebellious, he worked with them, he preserved them by these large forces, these governments, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and now he moves in the hearts of these who are not God's people to allow them to go back into the land and fulfill that which God had desired for them to do in the first place. So now this return takes place under the leadership primarily of three men, and we're going to look at these three men, and that's Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. We're going to look at these three this morning. It takes a span of about uh, looking at various chronologies. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 120 years that this uh, uh, re-entry into the land takes place. Now, Zerubbabel was living in captivity. He was of the lineage of King David. He was of nobility. All right. Now, it's interesting that the Jews, even in captivity, kept a record of who, you know, what tribe you were born into. Uh, you know, they kept a record of the lineage of their people, especially the lineage of, of David. And this comes into play in the lineage of Jesus Christ because we're able, as in, in Matthew and in uh, Luke, we see these lineages specified and, and spelled out and even in through the captivity and, and leading us up to show us that uh, Jesus was of the lineage of David, fulfilling the promise of God. Zerubbabel was in that lineage at the time that the Persians came to power over the Jews. If we go to Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, we're studying Jeremiah on Sunday evenings, and we'll see what this, this uh, uh, prophecy is But when we get there, but that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and the, hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So he, um, he, uh, the Lord had moved him to say, we, we need to build uh, the, the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Continuing on in verse 3, who is there among you of all his people? So he calls to the Jews, all you Jews, who is there among you? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. So he says, all you Jews that of a free will, you want to go? Go build the house of the Lord, in Jeru which is in Jerusalem. Verse 4, and whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, beside the free will offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then arose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites with all them whose spirit God had raised to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver and gold and goods and with beasts and with precious things beside all that, uh, beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem and had put them in the house of his gods. Even those did Cyrus king of Persia bring forth by the hand of Mithridath the treasurer and numbered them under Sheshbazar the prince of Judah. 
And this is the number of them. And he goes on and says how much of all of the vessels there were, the, the basins of gold, all the instruments that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple when he sacked and, and burned and destroyed Jerusalem uh, 70 years prior. And in verse, uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, Now these are the children of the province that went out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away into Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel. And then he goes on and lists those that were returning into the land. What we see here is Cyrus, God moves in the heart of Cyrus, that there should be the house of the Lord restored there in Jerusalem. And he gives the Jews the opportunity, and uh, in this account in Ezra, we even have the names of the people that go back to restore and rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel. In the process of trying to rebuild the temple, Zerubbabel and all the people, they encounter some opposition from the people of the neighboring lands. They get to setting the foundation of the temple. And it's there. everybody's excited. We're going to rebuild the temple of God in Jerusalem. And what happens? But the people around them start to say, oh, wait a minute. These guys are going to build them a city. And they're going to rebel against the king again. This is trouble. And so chapter 4 and verse 1, we see the opposition that starts to brew. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then, came, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Eskarhaddon, king of Asher, which brought us up with his, uh, brought us up hither. I mean, it seems good. They say, yeah, let us help. We want to help. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So they said, okay, if you're not going to let us join in, if you're not going to let us contribute to the building of the temple, then we're going to oppose it. We're going to frustrate the work and we're going to hire counselors, people that are going to come in and and just give bad advice and, and people that are going to uh, be naysayers against this project. Well, it worked for a while because they did send a letter to the, to the, to the new king and, said, and uh, stopped the work of the temple for a while. And the rebuilding was paused due to this opposition. But it's interesting because contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah, we also have the prophets of Haggai and Zechariah. And God sent Haggai and Zechariah to encourage the people to the work. And you can read about that in reading those prophets. If we go to Ezra chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2, then the prophets Haggai, uh, the, uh, then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo prophesied unto the Jews that were in Jerusalem and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel even unto them. And so they prophesied and, and encouraged them. In Ezra chapter 6, we read about them uh, finishing the building of the temple. Of course, there's a lot that goes on. I'm brushing, just brushing over this because I want us to get the big picture of how this all takes place. Ezra chapter 6, beginning in verse 14. And the elders of the Jew builded... And they were prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, and they, uh, Iddo, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished in the third day of the month Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. 
So they were excited. The temple's built now, even after their opposition. They've managed to, to work through that. They've got the support of the king, the, the most powerful uh, kingdom on the face of the earth at the time. They've got his support. They've got his blessing. The people of Israel are coming back into the land. It all looks very, very good. This temple is uh, known as Zerubbabel's temple. Of course, we've got Solomon's temple during, built during Solomon's reign. Zerubbabel's temple is built now. It was later torn down, and, 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 and Herod's temple was built in its stead. And uh, so we have these different temples that have built over time. But as they went to dedicate the temple, the people first had to separate themselves and purify themselves from the heathen practices of the land. In Ezra chapter 6 and verse 19, we continue on and it says, And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month. For the priests and the Levites were purified together, all, uh, were, uh, were purified together. all of them were pure, and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, and for their brethren the priests, and for themselves." And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had separated themselves from, unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land, to seek the Lord God of Israel, did eat, and kept the peace of the unleavened, uh, feast of the unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord had made them joyful, and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them, to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God the God of Israel. So they had peace, they had blessings, they had, there's just a little glimpse here that they had separated themselves from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel. So they had to do this separation before they could partake in the Passover. And as they part, uh, and so they had separated themselves from the practices of false religion from the false gods, from, from the various uh, intermingling uh, that they had had with the people of the land. You can imagine what it must have been like as they had vacated that land for 70 years and then they came back. The other nations had come in and set up idols to their gods and they come back from captivity. The temptation is there, and we're talking now uh, several decades have transpired since Zerubbabel uh, had, had first gone in. Uh, they dedicate the temple, and you can imagine how they're, they're having to kind of separate themselves out, remain, uh, keep their d distinction as the people of God, and not worshiping these other gods. But they did that. And so now we get another leader who comes on the scene, and this one's a spiritual leader, and this is Ezra. About 60 years after the temple was finished, God called Ezra to lead the people. In Ezra chapter 7 and verse 6, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his request according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and of the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So Ezra, God burdened his heart as well. He's still back in Babylon. And yet God moved in his heart. He was a scribe, and he had been preparing himself, studying the word of God for years. And he, God moved in his heart to, to do the law, to know the law, to do the law, and to be able to teach the law. He had prepared himself. You know, it takes preparation to be able to lead uh, in the word of God and to be able to teach in the word of God. And it takes hard work. It does. It takes a lot of study. It takes a, a willingness to want to know the truth and to be able to sort it out. And so 
We see here that as he goes and uh, prepares his heart, God uh, allows him, gives him the blessing of the king, and he goes to Jerusalem with the intent. His intent is to refurbish the temple with, bring, a, a, and get the vessels of worship back in there, restore the teaching and restore the priesthood and put God's house in order. Teach the people and teach the Levites so that they might teach the people. In Ezra chapter 9, he arrives in Jerusalem and he discovers a big problem. Ezra chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Now when these things were done, the princes came to me saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hands of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. And so he was astonished. And that's the old English word for astonished. He sat down and he found out that the priests, now the priests had been given specific orders by God in the law of Moses not to intermarry with the, the other nations of the land around them and to, um, to keep that lineage of the priesthood pure. And the chief of the princes and rulers had been uh, guilty of this. They, were, they, they had been leading in all, and allowing this. So Ezra sees, okay, we've got a big problem. We're not in accordance with the word of God in what he has told us to do. So in chapter 9, beginning in verse 4, we see what Ezra does about this. He was astonished. He was, he was heart sick about this. And in verse 4, then there assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of God of the God of Israel because of the transgression, transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonied until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and said, O my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. And in verse 15, O Lord, God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. How are they going to go about worship if the very family of people that God had ordained to lead in the worship, to touch the vessels of the temple, to order everything and to receive the sacrifices and to stand before God as intercessors between the people and Almighty God. How are they going to do that if that group of people had allowed themselves to become corrupt in their lives, in their thinking, and uh, just everything about their, uh, in their uh, life was now being, be, becoming separated from the, the law of God. And what does, Ezra do? what does Ezra do about that? He goes before the Lord. He takes this problem before the Lord and he confesses their sin. I can't help but think what might happen to our country if on Inauguration Day, whoever gets elected as president would bow before the Lord and say this prayer. <laughs> Repenting and say our sins are over our head. How can we stand before you, O oh God? I think it would do great wonders for our nation. I think it would turn the economy around. I think it would bring us to peace. I think it would lead to a lot of blessings from God if our leaders would pray a prayer like this. Ezra does this. He takes his prob problem to the Lord. They had acted, uh, uh, and so then the priests, they recognize this after his confession. And so they act upon the situation. They, they said, okay, we've got to do something about this. And so they, they identified all of the priests who had intermarried with the, the nations around them. 
And they separated out all of the priests and their families from God's service. They said, okay, we've got a purge here. And so they made this separation so that they could then go about worship in the temple. And of course we read about then Nehemiah comes on the scene. He's the next one that God uses in this history of the restoration of Jerusalem and, and the temple. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. Now a cupbearer, in case you don't know, there were always plots to assassinate the king. And the cupbearer, one, one of the ways of assassinating the king was to be just drop a little poison in his food or in his drink and uh, kill him through poisoning. The cupbearer was to make sure that that didn't happen, to taste everything in advance, and to, to be that, that uh, security, secret service, you might say, for the king. But not only that, he was somewhat of an advisor to the king. He was a, someone who was in the king's presence often, and uh, who knew the goings-on of the kingdom. Nehemiah is cupbearer to the king, and when he heard, he's also a Jew, he heard about the affliction. There, now, after some time, the people in Israel started to have, having some affliction again, and he heard that there was a great poverty. I mean, they, they're in the land, they've built the temple up, they're trying to get uh, worship restored, get order restored, but the city itself is in shambles. It's still pretty torn down. You know, I, I know that after, the, I read that after the Babylonians went through there, there was not a stone upon another. They melted the stones out to get the gold out that was in between the stones. And I mean, it, it probably looked worse than if a bomb had gone off in that city. They had just torn it apart. When we were in Russia, there was towns there that... Uh, through economic hardship and government programs, these towns, had, uh, in the, their history was that they had been established as outposts by the government, but then when they were no longer economically viable after the fall of the Soviet Union, the money dried up. There was no work for them to do. They, were, they had all been government employees, and now they're living out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no, there's no income. So people just left. Houses were abandoned, and those that remained there they went around the houses, breaking them down to get firewood to burn in their wood stoves. And I mean, it, literally, you drive through these towns, and there were a few houses with smoke coming out of the smokestacks, but the rest of them looked like, you know, it looked like a bomb had gone off. And it hadn't. It was just people tearing the place apart uh, and, and just falling apart through misuse and lack of care. I can imagine Jerusalem was much like that. And here the people are trying to live in that midst. They've got the temple built, but the city itself, and there's no walls. The, people, the, the enemies could just come in and invade at any moment. Nebuch and Nehemiah, Nehemiah hears about this, and his heart is broken. Our city, the great city of God, is left undefended. It's in shambles, and the people are struggling to get on their feet. And he's in great affliction, and the king of Persia recognizes this. He sees that Nehemiah's countenance is sad, and he asks. And, uh, uh, and he says, what can I do? And when he hears about Nehemiah's burden, and this is another miracle of God, this Persian king, not of the Jews, he hears of Nehemiah's burden, and he says, Nehemiah, you go fix the city. Build up the walls. Here's money to do it. Here's permits to go in and chop down all the trees you want. Here's a decree by sealed with my hand for everybody along the way to help you out and give you the trees out of my forest that you need. You go back in there and you build this wall. And so he gives Nehemiah time off from his job as cupbearer to go back and build the walls of the city of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. He surveys the situation he organizes the people, and they start rebuilding. I mean, he, he really gets things going. And yet again, the people of Jerusalem face opposition from the neighboring nations, so much so that they have to set armed watches over the work day and night. And they have to work with trowel or bow, in, uh, uh, I mean, sword or bow in one hand and trowel in the other. I mean, they have to be on guard the whole time they're building the walls of the city. But the walls get rebuilt. The city becomes secure. 
And Nehemiah and Ezra get together and they, the people build a pulpit out of wood and Ezra stands before the people and he reads out of the book of the law. Here we got the people in the city, the walls are built, the, the houses are being, being built, the things are getting organized, the temple is rebuilt, the priesthood has been put in place, the vessels are back in, in the temple. And uh, Ezra stands and he reads the law from morning till noon and, and all the people stand up and they hear it and as he's reading, he's got other elders there uh, of, the, of the tribes, and they give the sense, they cause the people to understand. So there's not only just the reading of the law, there's, there's explanation. And everybody that could hear and understand heard the word and understood it. And, and they repented and, and they listened. The Levites had taught them. They gave the understanding of the law. It seems like now... Nehemiah's work was done. He got the walls built, so he returns back to his job with the king of Babylon. But after some time, think about the pattern here. Nehemiah came, he got things established, he goes back. Think about a New Testament application of this that we've been studying here recently. Nehemiah is back at work, and then he hears word of things that are going back and he wants to go back and see how everything's do, going in Jerusalem. And so the king says, okay, take some time and go back. And so he gets some time off again, and he goes back to Jerusalem, and he finds, he goes back to the house of God, and he finds that the people there had allowed one of their enemies, Tobiah, to come in and take out the vessels of the house of the Lord and move all his household stuff in and say, wow, that's a nice house. He moved in, and the people said, well, that's, that's fine. We're going to let Tobiah move in. Tobiah had kind of intermarried with some of the rulers and, you know, with his family and all of that. So, you know, he was a good friend of the Jews, you know, supposedly. And, and so they, they allowed him to move right into the temple there. And even though the walls had been built around the city to keep the enemies out, the people were letting the strangers, the foreigners, come in on the Sabbath day, set up their booths and sell their wares, and, and they were going out into the fields outside of the walls on the Sabbath day and doing their work, plowing their fields. And in addition to that, the Levites, the priests, they weren't being cared for. The offerings weren't being gathered on the Sabbath day because nobody was going into the house of the Lord because they were out busy buying and selling and doing all of their work. And so what good did the walls do if the gates were open and everybody was just coming and going and they weren't? And what good was the temple doing if they weren't worshiping there and the priests weren't being cared for and the sacrifices weren't coming in to care for the priests to allow them to do that work? And this sent Nehemiah into a rage. He was absolutely upset. He went in and he started banging people over the head and plucking out their hair and, and, and setting things back in order. I hope I never become a pastor like that and walks around, bangs people on the head and pulls out their beards. You know, I heard of people that are similar to that. And I, I, yeah, no, we don't want to do that. We live by grace, don't we? And uh, praise the Lord for that. But Nehemiah, he went into a rage. And uh, he commands that the gates of the city be shut the night before the Sabbath. So shut the gates. And so when Sabbath gets here, nobody's coming in or going out. None of this buying and selling. And so then for a couple of weeks, you know, they, the people came right up to the walls and they were selling just outside the walls, hoping they could trade, you know, outside the walls. And that only lasted for a little while. And then that quit. He cleansed the priesthood too. Again, they had started to take in the strange wives, the foreigners. He restores the sacrifices and he restores the provisions for the priests. You know, in this, this is the New Testament similarity that I see. Remember how we've been studying how the Apostle Paul established the church in Galatia and in Coloss uh, and the churches of Colossia, a uh, uh, church in Colossae, and uh, he goes away, and then he uh, or even the church in Corinth, and then he gets news of what's going on there, and it's, it just doesn't sound very good. He has to, like uh, First and Second Corinthians, he has to write back to these churches and correct some problems that have started in the Galatians he writes back and says I stand in doubt of you was all my work in vain did I labor in vain for you to, to just receive the word of God receive the grace of God and then return back to the old ways of the law or or into the old ways of the heathen 
I see a similarity here. Both with Zerubbabel, he gets the, he gets the temple built, and what do they do? They, they, they start forsaking that. With Ezra, he teaches, he gets things established, and then the people uh, uh, accept it for a while, and then they turn away from it. With Nehemiah, he, he gets the walls built, he restores the priesthood again, the sacrifices, and he, and he has to deal with this intermingling problem again. And then he goes away for a little while and everything just kind of falls apart. I read an interesting commentary on this that uh, you can look on Amazon.com and find all kinds of books of leadership that will tell you, uh, use Ezra and Nehemiah as examples. But if you look at the fruits of their labors, it wasn't lasting. Maybe they were good leaders and, and as long as they were present, things were going on okay. But when they left the people started to revert back to their old ways. Same thing happened to the Apostle Paul. Same thing happens to missionaries all around the world today. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, they all show us some important truths. One is that God will raise up men to do his work in leading people unto himself. God is faithful. God remains faithful through all of these situations. There will be opposition from unbelievers when God's men go about doing their work, when, when a people des, de, de, desire within their, themselves to uh, serve the Lord, there will be opposition. But we also see that we have to be diligent. As long as we are on this earth, we have to be diligent to keep ungodly influences from opposing the work of God just as they did, just as they had to work with uh, sword and trowel, as the saying goes. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah show us that even with the best intentions of godly men, with the finances and support of the government, and with the blessings given by the people along the way, men are not capable of sustaining true worship on this earth unless they are born again and their hearts are changed forever. I mean, this is just a good object lesson for us. Man is not capable of sustaining true worship all by himself. Not by the works of the law. Not by strong leadership. There has to be a heart change of the people. The people's hearts have to be broken before God. Even among those today who profess Christ, these same patterns can be observed. There's godly men who share the word. They go to foreign lands or they, they forsake and sacrifice many things to preach the word of God. They have a desire in their heart to preach the word of God, to build up houses of worship. And, 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 and by that I mean people that are surrendered, churches that, of people that are surrendered to, to serve the Lord. They build this up. The people join in. There's opposition from ungodly and from the ungodly. There's intermingling with the world. And there's separation from God. And we get back to the need for repentance. We see this pattern going on even today in the work of God on this earth. For some who have received the word in the stony places... Or among the thorns, the opposition and temptations that arise, they're too much and they fall away. We see this in the parable of the sower. But those who receive the word on the good ground of genuine repentance and humility before God, humbling themselves before God, they're saved. And they bear forth the fruits of that salvation, and they shall not be moved forever. That's the mark of a true disciple of Christ, one that will not be moved. In all of this, there were people that were not moved. There were people who remained faithful. But by and large, there was the problems that arose that had to be dealt with by the leaders, by Zerubbabel, by Ezra, and by Nehemiah. There were, there were a small group of people in there who were truly sorrowful at the general state of their nation as they started to fall back into these temptations. And we see that in churches and amongst Christianity today. 
you know there's going to be one more Jerusalem. Now, there is no temple in Jerusalem right now. They got destroyed again. The Lord allowed it to be destroyed by the Romans. There's going to be one more temple in Jerusalem. At the time of the millennium, Jesus Christ is going to establish his rule in Jerusalem. There's going to be a temple there. There's going to be worship there. But even it will be destroyed with all the earth. All this earth is going to be destroyed until such time as there's a new Jerusalem and a new heavens and a new earth. And all that's ever been built in Jerusalem and all that was built in the tabernacle in the wilderness, that was all just patterns of the heavenly anyways. What the true temple of God is in his presence. And that's going to, uh, in the new heaven and the new earth, that will finally, there will be a place of worship that cannot be corrupted, that cannot fall away because of the sins of man. No hand of man will have been used to construct it. All those other temples, they were built by the hand of man, under the leadership of godly men, under the design by Moses, but still by the hand of man. And the temple that will be, no hand of man is going to build it. It'll be inhabited entirely by the redeemed. It won't be inhabited by people who can fall away unto sin because we will be born all that will be there will be born again no corruption will be there whatsoever because it's all of God and it's all by God and so the question is as we see this pattern that, that, that developed through Zerubbabel, Ezra and Nehemiah we see that no matter what man does we corrupt it and we fall away so easily the only real thing that holds us in true worship is genuine salvation, becoming a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ, being born again, being saved, and not, we will not be moved. Our position with God will not be moved because of the faithfulness of God, and we will not be moved because of our love for God. So my question this morning is, when that finally, when we, that temple and God is with man, and man is with God. The redeemed of the Lord are with him. Will you be there? Will you be there? Or will you be one of those that goes along for a while and then falls away because of the temptations of the world, because of just the, um, the intermingling and the, the, the tearing down of, of the things that, that were keeping you uh, Religious. Well, your your religious your religiosity, as it says, as it said sometimes, that won't save you. Being born again in Jesus Christ will will bring you there. That is the only way. God offers that. God is not far. His salvation is unto all, but it's upon all them that believe, as we read earlier this morning. Will you be there? Don't think that we can establish religion. And that is absolutely perfect and pure. Not until such time as a soul is born again and the gathering of born-again souls come together. This is the closest thing right now that we have here. Closest thing on earth that we, that we have to what we will have in heaven. Born-again souls in Jesus Christ committing together to serve the Lord together as a temple of the Lord in this place. Let's all stand. We're going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have a song of invitation. If you're not sure whether you would be with the Lord or not, or maybe you can say, well, I was brought up in church. I know I'm religious. We go to church every Sunday, whether I want to or not. You need to look and see if the Lord truly is master of your heart. And if you truly are submitted unto him, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the testimony of your word. Thank you, Lord, for moving in the hearts of men to, to do your work, whether they be of your people or whether they be of people of the world around us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you do move in the hearts of men. We thank you, Lord, for your purposes. Forgive us, O Lord, even as Ezra prayed. How, Lord, that we are, 
We're sinful before you, but yet, Lord, you're faithful before us all the time. Lord, I pray that we would be reminded that we would be encouraged, even as the people were encouraged by Haggai and Zechariah, to encourage, encourage to keep doing your work. And Lord, when we see things coming into our lives, we see the need to repent. Help us, Lord, to be courageous and do it. Help us, Lord, to stand forth and stand in the light of your truth, Heavenly Father, not in the darkness of any hidden shadows and hidden shadows of our lies, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, that in all of this you would get the glory and that you'd move in our hearts even now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What shall we sing? 419. Victorious. 419.